Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Rat Pack uh, Thursday night. Tonight's presentation is going to be on FT8 and FT4, uh, so-called digital sound card modes. We're going to talk a little bit about getting on them, what you can do with them, and some other things. So let me go ahead and jump in. This presentation I'm doing tonight, the slides, I'm not going to give you the full slideshow, but the full slideshow is at tiny.cc slash FT8 FT4. Uh, there's over 120 slides in there with details on how to do the setup, but I will spare you all those slides tonight. So this is a slightly shorter version. My contact information and my website. This is me operating FT8 uh, uh, for field day in 2019 in Vermont. I'm operating two Bravo, one Bravo, two radios, battery powered, one operator. On the on my right in the photograph, uh, the computer that you can see, I'm doing uh, C CW or single sideband, depending on which one I'm doing at the time. But on my left, I'm operating FT8. Uh, so I was operating both, and I can do that with FT8. I can't do that with two single sideband stations or even two CW stations, but I can manage to squeeze it in. I call it my multitasking mode. I got started with JT65. Uh, a few years back and then moved into FT8 and one of the nice things is I'm spend I spend a lot of time in front of my computer my radio so these are modes I can do while I'm doing other things in my shack it also works great with my QRP signal I run five watts all the time so um, you don't have to run low power but it works well with low power some of the reasons I got started with it was I wanted to increase my worked all state totals uh, on some of the less used bands. I also was trying to get North Dakota on 160. As it turned out, I ended up getting North Dakota with CW before I got it with uh, FT8. But uh, I now have 10 of the 11 bands, uh, 160 through 10 meters worked all states with FT8. I'm waiting for two more states on six meters to complete my 11 band worked all states. It works great for the lower bands. I have a marginal antenna and not a real big lot here. I'll show you my setup here in a few seconds. Uh, but it's been very helpful with 160. Running 5 watts on 160 with a little sloper antenna. The best DX I've gotten is South Africa at about 13,000 miles. Uh, Siberia at about 8,500. And then one of the most exciting contacts was I was looking at the screen and thought it said ES1 which would have been Estonian, that would have been exciting in itself, but it turned out to be E51 in North Cook Island. In just three years during Sunspot Local, I worked 219 uh, countries. I've now moved beyond that a little bit uh, over the last couple of years, and with the Sunspot numbers increasing, for example, this morning I worked 40 contacts on FT4 on 10 meters. Uh, with about 15 countries in that mix. Here's my worked all states. You can see the two I'm missing. FT8 and FT4 are great if you have marginal antennas or you don't have a great signal. If you have a uh, home uh, owners association with limited privileges for antennas, maybe you're forced to go with attic antennas or temporary antennas. A lot of people use a temporary antenna like this magnetic loop. Uh, and magnetic loops work well, but one of the problems is you're always having to adjust it. Every time you QSY at all change frequency, you have to go over there and tweak the magnetic loop, which is a real pain. But what the nice thing about FT8 and FT4 is once you get onto a band, you stay in the same place. You don't touch that tuning knob. Uh, we'll show you that a little bit later when I do the demonstration. So something like this, a portable magnetic loop antenna would be just great for FT8. Over the years, you can see I was working primarily CW and uh, single sideband with a little bit of RIDI thrown in there. But what happened in 2016 is I attended the Toledo Area Ham Fest and I found out about JT65 and I started working that in March of 2016. That is what the orange section is here. Let me fix this screen color real quick here. Just one second, my blue blocker came on. and There we go back to our slideshow again. So this orange color is uh, the beginning of working JT65. What happened the next year is JT65, I continued to work it, but during the early spring or early summer, late spring, 
FT8 came out, and you can see that FT8 became a big portion of my operating. The next year, almost half my contacts on, in 2018 were on FT8, and then in 2019, FT4 came out, so that's the yellow area there. So you can see over the years, I have a mix of CW, single sideband, FT8, FT4, and RIDI, and a little bit of PSK thrown in there, not a lot. Some of the myths about FT8 and FT4, uh, the first myth is that, that FT8 requires internet to make QSOs, and that's not at all the case. There are a couple cases where the internet helps you, but it has nothing at all to do with actual contact. What you use the internet for is to synchronize the time on your computer. And uh, you want the time synchronized within a half a second. And Windows uh, synchronization doesn't work well enough, so you actually need a third-party software. Now, that's where the internet comes in. Having a stable internet connection allows you to keep your clock synchronized. But a couple years ago, my wife and I were in Delaware for field day, and I worked field day on the Saturday and Sunday, and then I stayed there for the rest of the week at a cabin without internet. Now, after about two days, my computer's time started to drift because it couldn't be standardized with the uh, standard on, on the Internet. So I would drive down to the McDonald's, pull into the drive through resync my computer to the Wi-Fi there and get my time resynchronized, buy a milkshake, and then drive back to the cabin. Now, I wouldn't have needed the Internet in that case if I would have had a simple $12 USB dongle, I'm sorry, a GPS dongle for my uh, laptop. So you don't need the internet as long as you have a way to keep your time synchronized. And a, a, a GPS dongle will do that very easily. The second myth is no operators required. And I'll show you some evidence of why an operator is required on one of the next upcoming slides. The third one is that no operator skill is required. Well, I think maybe you can make a contact with very little skill, but if you want to be successful and make a lot of contacts and work rear stations, you're going to need a little bit of skill just like in any other area. Another myth is there's no homebrew or kits for digital. And then finally, only new radios can be used. And we'll break that myth also. So here's an example of why you need a person there. It is an automatic. Uh, this is a site called PSK Reporter, and it's an aggregating site. What it does is anyone who has their, com their computer on and running WSJTX can feed their decodes back to a central site called PSK Reporter. And that shows all the stations that are hearing you. Not the stations that are working you, but simply stations that are decoding your signal. So for over 20 minutes on March 26, 2019, on 160 with my 5 watts, I was being heard at a minus 6 dB, which is a perfectly fine signal to make a contact with with Antarctica. I called repeatedly over the 20 minutes, no one answered. So obviously the radio was turned on, but there was no operator at the shack. So this is an example of the one that got away, and it was because it is an automatic, you do need people. Um, a little bit about getting started with uh, what you need to operate FT8, FT4. So you need a radio, HF mainly, but you can also use this on VHF. Uh, there is FT8 activity quite a bit on 6 meters, actually a very large amount. And on contest weekends, you'll hear FT8 activity on 2 meters. So this coming Saturday, by the way, is the AWRL VHF UHF January contest. And I'm sure if you want to give it a try, you'll get a chance to work a lot of FT8 on 6 meters and possibly some 2 meters and maybe even some 440. But the radio needs to be capable of single sideband, so you can't do this with your FMHT or your CW-only radio. Uh, you need a radio capable of single sideband transceive. You need a computer, and the great thing is the software is available to operate on Windows, Linux, OS X, even a Raspberry Pi will run the software just fine. You need a sound card or sound card interface. Now, it may be built into your radio ahead of time. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And then you need some software, and the software is free. So let's look at some radios under $2,000 under $2, radios that currently have built-in sound cards. Most of the new radios on the market that you can go out and buy right now have a sound card included in them. There are two radios I know of that are currently for sale that don't have sound cards in them, and that is the ICOM 718 and the Yaesu 891. Both of these two radios don't have a built-in sound card, but that's not a problem. You can add an external sound card. 
Uh, some radios don't require a sound card like the KX2 or KX3. You can actually run these just with audio ca with cables to the, your built-in uh, traditional sound card or your USB sound card. You don't need an interface. But in most cases, most of these people do use uh, a sound card interface with these radios in the pink and the yellow. Now, to break the myth about old radios, here's a 1975 vintage Argonaut 509, maybe 79, which depends on when it was built. And I don't have any CAC control, of course, because the radio is incapable of computer control. So I had to set the frequency manually. You can see right now it is set on 14.080. And what I'm operating here is FT4. I have a sound card interface. Uh, plugged in with a rather kludge box of uh, parts here. Uh, just plugged it in the microphone and the and the audio coming out of the the headphone jack, feeding it into my sound card and then into a computer. Worked just perfectly fine. First try, workstations. I can't change bands without actually reaching over and clicking the switch and tuning it in, but it works just fine. The computer software is WSJTX. And the site is temperate. Well, by the way, anytime you see this type of uh, font or this little sign, that means it's a link you can click on. And that link will take you out to the uh, site for the software. You can also click on the little image here. Now, there is a problem with the Princeton site right now. I'm not sure if they resolved it yet. So what you probably want to do instead is go to WSJTX on the um, Sorge, Force, Sorge Force site to get your software. And I will change that link in there. So you can download the software from here. And as if you look at the software, you'll see that it's available in a wide variety of formats for different uh, computers. There's Macintosh software, there's Linux software, there's Windows software, etc. And they just came out with the newest version, 2.61. Uh, and here, here's the information on it, and then the various files to download and install. 2.6 was a release candidate until a couple weeks ago. Then 2.60 came out as an official uh, software, and then they did one update to 2.6.1. So you need that software. It's also helpful to have some other software. JT Alert for Windows or Alarm JT for Linux both work pretty much the same. They just add some extra features, and I'll demonstrate that when I actually do the software demonstration. If you're running it on Windows, you're going to need something to synchronize the time, and there's some free software out there that will synchronize the time just fine. The monitoring site I was showing you earlier, uh, PSK Reporter, you don't need to download anything because it is an online website. You need a method to generate audio, and uh, this is where the sound card comes in, either the sound card in the radio, the sound card interface. That's used to generate audio and to receive audio so your sound card is actually acting like a modem uh, to demodulate and modulate the signal that you're going to feed out through the radio and come in through the radio you need a way to key the radio's push to talk this is typically cat control or the sound card interfaces have built-in keying you can also use the radio's vox and you can actually do manual push to talk switching if you wanted to if you're good at timing down to just a few split seconds you will also need to make some changes with your radio. And it's not physical changes. It's just going to be a matter of making some setting changes. So these are all links to information on radios that I've worked with with other people or myself. I actually wrote the one on the K3S uh, uh, here. So the, when you click on these links, they'll give you information on setting up your radio, setting up the software, etc. And again, even if your radio is not listed here, I'm sure if you do a quick search on YouTube, there'll be a how to set up your radio for FT8 and FT4. If your radio does not have a built in sound card, you can buy one of these sound card interfaces. And these run anywhere from $49 for the DigiRig Mobile to about $125 for the Signal Link. Uh, the cables are extra with the Digi, DigiRig Mobile, where you can build your own cables. So if you buy cables for this, you're looking at about $80 with the cables. Here you're looking at about $115 to $120 with the cables, about $100. Both of these, the Mini Pro and the MFJ, 
or just over 100. There are some other versions of sound card interfaces, but most of them are more expensive or a little more esoteric. You're going to need the software to uh, do time synchronization. For Windows, I'm running the Mindberg. A lot of people run the Dimension 4. These both work just fine. You can pick whichever one you want to try out and then install the software. Now, in the full slideshow presentation, I have step-by-step -step of what settings you need to do in, Win in WSJTX. I'll demonstrate a few of those tonight, but I'm not going to go through all the settings. All of those are listed on the tiny.cc FT8 FT4. Now, you're also going to notice this is version 2.1.2, so the menus have changed slightly. I haven't had a chance to do the new screenshots this week, but I will be replacing all the screenshots in this presentation with the newer version of software. It's very important every time you operate, before you start your WSJT-X software up, always make sure you have your radio turned on, all your cables connected your sound card interface if it's an external sound card interface make sure everything is up and ready to go before you start the program or it will go fishing around to find a sound card and it probably won't be the one you want or it'll go fishing around to find a cat control port it probably won't be the one you want so make sure everything's on before you start the software by the way just while i'm here i'm just going to mention one thing if your computer i'm sorry your radio requires drivers to connect to your computer uh, make sure you install the drivers first before you connect the cables between your radio and your computer. That will also save you a bunch of headaches. So let's say you bought a brand new radio and there was drivers for it. Make sure you install the drivers before you connect the USB cable between the computer and the radio. That will save you a lot of headaches. Some operating tips. Because FT8 and FT4 uh, basically... Uh, our full uh, time modes very similar to RIDI, uh, I would suggest you don't run your radio at any higher power than you would run it for RIDI. And if you don't run RIDI, take a look in your manual and see what the suggested settings are for power output. So with a typical 100 watt radio, most of the companies suggest you run it between 35 and 50 watts of power. I suggest about 40 is usually a safe number if you don't know a number. Don't worry, that'll be plenty of power to workstations. But you don't have to be limited to low power. I know people that run a kilowatt on FT8, FT4. But if you're running a standard 100-watt radio, please don't run too much power and overheat your radio. By the way, as the FCC rules state, remember, you should always use the minimum power necessary to carry out these IR communications. So there's really no reason to run a kilowatt for 99.999999% of the contacts on FT8. You'll be able to make contacts just fine with much lower power than that. It's very important on your radio that you turn off all speech processing, noise blanking, di uh, digital noise filters, di uh, DSP, et cetera, et cetera. Make sure your filters are set as wide as possible. You don't want to narrow that bandwidth down. Just the opposite of what you want to do with most modes. There are a lot of contradictions with FT8, FT4. In most modes, you want to have a narrow bandwidth so you're only hearing the station you want to work. In most modes, you want to tune into the station itself. In this case, we're going to tune anywhere but on the station itself. And unlike all the other data modes, almost all the data modes operate on lower sideband. This is the exception. If your radio does not have a data mode, you want to use upper sideband for FT8 and FT4. Now, this slide is a little bit busy, but what this slide is, during the pandemic, I helped a lot of people set up FT8, FT4 on their computers. A lot of them remotely, some of them in person, but either way, what happened is when you help a lot of people get set up in a new mode, you're going to get a lot of phone calls. So I put together this slide <coughs> and passed it out to my friends. and told them whenever FT8, FT4 wasn't working, go through this list before you call me. So I'm gonna suggest you do the same thing. Whenever you're having any problem, go through this checklist and vast majority of the time it'll solve your problem. The first thing is, especially with Windows updates, sound card settings get changed. 
And I just had a friend call me today. His sound card change settings all changed when he ran his Windows update. So be aware of this. Know what they should be set at so you can go back and reset them if they get changed. If your time synchronization stops or gets too far off, you won't be able to make contacts. Now, I had a friend. He was working just fine, and then all of a sudden, nothing was working. And what happened was his computer that he had his time synchronization software running on lost its internet connection. He didn't realize it because he doesn't use it for any other internet other than that time synchronization. So once he got the time synchronized, everything was fine again. If by chance you set your radio bandwidth filter narrower and not at its maximum, you'll have many problems. So if I were to operate RIDI one day and then switch back to FT8, my radio still has the narrow bandwidth filter for RIDI set and not the wide bandwidth filter that I want for FT8. Is the radio in the correct mode? Again, if your radio has the data mode uh, as one of your possible modes, use that. If not, you want to use USB. You don't want to use lower sideband. You don't want to use CW. You don't want to use AM. You don't want to use FM. You want to be either using data preferably or USB if it doesn't have a data mode. And then you want to check to make sure that you're actually using the program you think you're using in the WSJTX suite. It's called a suite because there's actually about, oh, about six programs in it different modes of operation if you're using the one you think you want you're in good shape but if you're using the one you don't want uh, you won't make any contacts there's three little boxes and you should have them all checked and i'll show you those as we do the demonstration there is also something called a special operating activity mode and if you have that set when you don't want it or don't have it set when you do want it that can cause problems and then finally the very basic question, is the radio working on other modes? I had a friend call me. He's about a mile and a half from the house. He says, all of a sudden, I can't make any FT8, FT4 contacts. So I said, let's get on the air, and let me see if I can make contact with you. And I made a contact fairly easily. And he said, that's the only one I've been able to make. I can't make contacts with anyone else. And we tracked out a few things. We couldn't figure out what was going on. It was nighttime. The next morning, he called me and said, I went outside. My coax is laying on the ground, but my antenna is still in the air. So about a mile and a half from his house, we made the contact via his coax, but he wasn't having much success with other stations via coax only. So having an antenna can be very helpful. So check to make sure the radio is working on other modes if you're having a problem with FT8 or FT4. We'll come back to that in a minute. So the basic operations is you start up the program, make sure you have everything connected ahead of time, as I said earlier, choose the mode you want to operate, FT8 or FT4, and then choose the frequency you want. Now, the nice thing is the program keeps track of the default frequencies for each mode for each band. So if I say I want to operate FT8 and I click on the little drop down menu and I go to 20 meters, it would be one thing. If I went to another, it would be a different one. Now, this is set for FT4 actually right now. So on FT4, the default frequency for 20 meters is 14.080. The default for FT4 is 14.074 but you don't need to remember those. Now, sometimes though, you wanna operate on a frequency other than the default frequency. That is typically the case when there's a rare DX station and they're operating on a different part of the band so they don't clog up the regular portion of the band. The nice thing is you can simply click right here on the drop down and type in the frequency you want and that'll change the frequency to whatever you want it to be. And I'll actually demonstrate that in a few moments here. I mentioned the three boxes. The three boxes have actually changed a little bit. The one that says call first is actually a drop down menu. But let's talk about the first one. That is the whole transmit frequency. As I mentioned earlier, you don't want to transmit on the frequency of the station you're trying to work. So what we do is we set our frequency to a clear frequency. When we double click on a station to work them, if we do not have this box checked, it will automatically change my frequency to the same frequency as the station I'm trying to work. So that's definitely not what we want. So always make sure you have this box checked. The next one is the auto sequence box. And the auto sequence box means after you make your initial contact with the station, the computer will take over and send the specific responses. So after I answer his CQ and he answers me, we'll automatically send signal reports and then we'll automatically send 73. 
And then the final one is this call first. And as I said, it's a little drop down now, but this means that if you're calling CQ and someone answers you, you will answer the first station that responded to you. You now have three choices. The choices are call first. Uh, let me, I can actually look at the list because I can't remember. It just came out. It is call first, maximum distance, or none. And if you have none selected, that means you're not going to respond to anyone when uh, after you call CQ if they respond to you. I have it set for maximum distance because I'd rather work the far away stations first because they might fade out. But you could easily set it for first. Either first or maximum distance is my suggestion. This is an example of the band map and the, or the waterfall. And this is showing uh, the frequencies that I'm receiving. I'm going to actually show you the real band map here. Makes a lot more sense. So this is the band map, and I'm on 20 meters right now. And you'll notice that there are stations here. And what happens is it's 15-minute segments. So every 15 seconds, I'm sorry, 15 seconds, not 15 minutes, you'll see that there's a gap, and then the same station will start transmitting again. So here we go. These three down at the bottom are going to be here again. When I, before I transmit, what I need to do is find a place where no one is at. So I'm going to put my mouse right here. I'm going to click on it, and I'm going to put my transmit right there. So that's where I'm going to transmit. This basically is showing kilohertz of bandwidth, or I'm sorry, hertz of bandwidth, of bandwidth starting at zero. So I'm on 20 meters right now, so my radio is set for 14.047. I'll just show you what it looks like right there. So you actually see where it's at. So zero would co correspond with that point. 500 would correspond with 14.0740, oh, I'm sorry, 5. 1,000 would correspond with 14075. Oh, 15 would correspond with 147150. Oh. 2,000 would correspond with 14.076. Oh, it doesn't matter what you choose, but you always want to choose an empty spot. If you're transmitting on top of another station, you're not going to be able to hear that station, and other stations are not going to be able to hear them either. Now, there, there's some color coding here. Don't worry about that right now. We'll talk about what each of those colors mean in a few seconds here when I do the demonstration. So let's look at a typical uh, receive of decoded stations. These are the stations that I'm hearing and decoding. If a station has green on it, that means it's calling CQ. If a station has gray on it, that means I worked it before. So even though HB9 is calling CQ, he's in gray because I worked him before. When you see anything in white or any other color, that means a QSO is going on and you're seeing two stations. The station on the right is the one you're decoding. The station on the left is the one that they're working. So at this little example I'm pointing to right here, it says UA3XHZ is send, sending 73 to F5NAA. I might not even be able to copy him the next time, the F5. I'm copying the, the UA3. So I could potentially double click on him and try and work him. I can't double click on the FN5 because I'm not decoding him. He's the station that the other station is working. Now, let's give an example of me calling CQ. So I'm calling CQ. You can see CQ, KZT, EN91. That's what you send when you're sending CQ. You send your grid square. This station, W8SIC, answered me. So he sent KZT, this is W8SIC, he was also an EN91. My computer, as soon as it saw his response, automatically responded to him, W8SIC, this is KZT, you're plus 12 dB. He then responded, KZT, this is W8SIC, Roger, you're plus 12 dB, you're minus 10 dB here. And then I sent automatically Roger Roger 73. Now I stopped doing the screen capture, but what happened next is he sent me a 73 and you're not seeing it on the screen here. But that's a typical QSO when I'm calling CQ. Now let's look at a typical QSO when I'm answering a CQ. So right here, K4 IIA is calling CQ. And these are the left boxes, everyone I'm decoding, not just station, not just the station I'm working, excuse me, but everyone I'm decoding. 
I double clicked on that with my mouse and that caused my computer to send this right here k4 iia khct en91 now he didn't answer me the first time but the second time i sent it he answered me and he sent back kzt this is k4 iia your minus 20 db i then sent roger your plus 5 db he then sent roger roger 73 i then sent 73 and we were done now you might notice that we don't have a lot of text here the maximum number of characters you can send is 14 characters. Uh, now, you can squeeze a few more in there for expanded calls and things like that, but you're not going to rag chew or carry on a conversation at 14 characters per line. And each of these lines with FT8 takes about 15 seconds. Now, I mentioned a little bit earlier that there are some special modes of operation. You can set these. This is for setting things like field day exchange or something called fox and hound, which is when a DX station operates in the fox mode and you would operate in the hound mode. And I'll explain how that works a few moments here. I'm going to skip on that. Skip that. Okay, we don't need to go through that. Okay. So, when you first start out, once you transmit, if no one answers you immediately, after you transmit a few times, if you go to this page called PSK Reporter, okay, why is my link not working? I have to fix that. PSK Reporter. And you put your call sign in. Okay, we will come back to that in a few seconds because for some reason it is not starting up. But fortunately, I have a screenshot of it here. I put my friend's call sign in here. These are all the stations that heard him. Now, he had it set for 24 hours. So over 24 hours, these are the stations that were decoding him. Each of the different colors represents a different band. Each of the times tells you how long ago. And then the DB figure tells you how strong you were at that location. So we can take a look here. This is me in the last 24 hours. Hopefully it will load. There we go. So in the last 24 hours, these are the stations that heard me. Now, I haven't been on the last couple hours because I've been in a couple meetings this afternoon. But you notice that 10 hours ago, uh, Rodriguez Island heard me at minus 10 dB on... 28.181 so that was ft4 on 10 meters uh seven hours ago i was heard in fiji uh in the five hours ago i was heard in south africa now i worked a five zulu station right here six hours ago but i actually worked him but it doesn't tell you you worked him or not this is just showing that they heard you and decoded you there was a station in Saudi Arabia. I actually worked him also on 10 meters this morning. Station in Alaska. Now, let's say you decide, okay, this sounds good, but I'm not really interested. You can also use this PSK reporter as long as you know someone that lives in your neighborhood as a propagation tool. So my friend Jim lives about five miles from me, so I type in his call sign. Even if I didn't operate FT8, I could use Jim as my guinea pig to see who was hearing him, and that'll tell me where propagation is open. So all you need to know is know someone in your general area who's on FT8 and FT4, and you can use them as Bless you. You muted yourself. I'm sorry. Thank you. When I was sneezing, this is my friend Jim, and he was on 48 minutes ago, and you noticed he was hearing a bunch of stations in Japan, and three hours ago he was heard down in the Philippines, uh, Hawaii, 45 minutes ago. So as long as you know someone that that you that's on. Now let's say you're chasing a DX station. TN8K has been on. You can see who was who was hearing him around the world. And that'll give you a good idea of where propagation was at. And this is who was hearing TNAK. 
Now, the nice thing is, let's say TNAK doesn't have internet access and no one's spotting him. Well, even if no one's spotting him, I can tell where he's being heard by looking at who's decoding him around the world. Now, the only stations you're going to see these reports from, though, are stations that have internet access. So let's say you're trying to work a station in Chad and you go and listen and see who's, you, 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 he's not showing up as hearing you. Well, that's because he might not have internet access there. So this isn't a sure indication that someone's not hearing you, but it will tell you when someone is hearing you. So that's the end of the formal program, but I'm going to do some demonstrations, but I will take some questions first. Just a reminder though, here's my contact information. And also, all my slideshows are available at this link. I'll put this in the chat a little later. And you can see all the different slideshows I have. If your local club's interested in one, I'd be happy to do one. But let me go ahead and hide this part and bring up FT8 and FT4. Let me close a couple things that are open in the background here. Okay. So here's FT8, FT4. Don't worry about the colors because I have some colors set a little bit differently than other people, but the green means people are calling CQ. I'm on 20 meters right now. My antenna is pointing to the northwest. I'm going to swing it around a little bit more to the west here. Okay, I'm going to swing it around a little more to the north because I see some stations I might want to work. Oh, there's Argentina to the south. Now, this, off, this big window on the, on the left here is JT Alert, and this screen down at the bottom is JT Alert. This part right here is the WSJTX, and this band map is WSJTX. These other two programs, uh, other two windows are coming from this program. I installed this helper program called WJT Alert. Now, I can see the stations that are transmitting here, and I can double-click on this station in Aruba. I'm going to swim my antenna around the Aruba. The reason it's showing in purple is because I have it set up right now to show me the stations that I haven't worked yet this year so I can get credit for the DX Marathon. Um, I'm at 89, no, I'm at 91 stations now, so I'd like to get another nine stations before the, before the end of the month so I get my first 100 by the end of January. And by the way, a couple weeks ago on Rat Pack, we had a speaker talk about the DX Marathon. So if you're interested, you could go back and listen to that presentation by uh, W3C, I forget the rest of his call. I think it's W3CWC, but I can't remember for sure. So I double clicked on this P40. And when I did that, it started transmitting to him. But notice he's making contact with an HK3G. Now, normally if this was single sideband or CW, when he's talking, I would stop talking. But here I can transmit because I'm transmitting here. He's listening here. And I'm not bothering him at all while he's talking to the other station. Now, he finished up with the other station. I'm sorry, he sent Roger 21 to the other station. He should finish it up with him this time. We should probably see a 73 from him this time. We'll see. And hopefully, he'll answer me. This little timer down here shows us each of the time segments. On FT8, they're 15 seconds long. So he, sent, he went back to another station. I'm going to double click on this other one here, this other P40, P40AA. So now I'm transmitting my signal. I'm transmitting right now, and I'll transmit till 12 and a half seconds, and then it will stop. Now the transmitter turned off, and everyone's doing their decodes. Now I'm in the next segment, and I'm listening for the next 12 and a half seconds. And at the end of 12 and a half seconds, my computer will start decoding them. It's already started. And there's the Papa 40 Alpha, and he and he said 73 to the KA1 FUE. So I'm now transmitting again. I'm sending my call to him. Hopefully he'll hear me and answer me. So now end of 15 seconds, I stop transmitting. I gotta wait now as he transmits in this segment. He's transmitting on the even segment. I'm transmitting on the odd. So he started at zero zero, and I will start again at 15 seconds after. Now, he went back to WA4II. He didn't answer me, but I'm still going to call because, again, I'm not bothering him at all. Unlike single sideband, unlike C CW, it's fine to call the station when they're talking to someone else. You will not bother them. Matter of fact, he'll see me as a big red line across the screen. He's probably decoding me. Now, with his really strong signal, he's probably decoding a dozen stations, so it's a matter of him picking out which one he wants to respond to. And now he just responded to me, and he said, I'm plus three. I sent back, Roger, you're plus 15. 
I'm running 5 watts. He's probably running a lot more power than I am. That's fine, though. They all count. And you can actually work stations down to minus 24 dB on FT8 and about minus 20 on FT4. So a really good CW operator might get down to minus 15. A good single sideband operator can operate with a signal to noise ratio of plus 10. So you notice that I've just completed this contact without any problem when I was plus 3 dB. It would have been hard pressed to do that on single sideband. Now notice he has three signals in the passband. That is because he is using a special tool that some of the DXers call. There's two different tools. One is MSHV, that's multi-strand. Multi so he's actually sending three signals at the same time so he can work three different stations at the same time. So you notice he worked NG5IT and he worked WB5MTV at the same time he worked me. That's one mode. The other mode is called Fox and Hound. The difference on Fox and Hound is you only see one row, but you'll see multiple call signs in the line of text. Now, we could double click on another one of these stations if we wanted to and start working them, or I could simply choose down here to say CQ, turn on enable transmit, and now I'll be sending CQ and we'll see if anyone answers me. So what I'll do now is while we're waiting to see if anyone answers me, I'll pause and start taking questions. And I'll keep my screen share up so you can see what's going on. Looks like we've got a lot of stuff in the chat. Let me see what we got here. Just chat. Okay. Does it work with the DRA board? Yes, it does. DR, the, the, the master's communication DRA boards are a great example of an external sound card interface. Okay. That was from Scott. On the K3S, avoid exactly 5 or 50 watts. Yeah, I use 4.9 watts. On my, I have a K3S uh, 10. Um, what is recommended call CQ for? Oh, by the way, if you're call, making any special calls, put the special call between the CQ and your call sign. Never put it after your call sign. That causes a lot of problems because it looks like two stations in. So, if, for example, if I wanted to call C JA stations, I put in CQ JA there. And now that would transmit CQJA. If I wanted Missouri, I might put in CQMO. If I wanted North Dakota, I might put in ND. But never put it after your call sign. That'll just cause problems. The only thing you should be putting after your call sign is if you have a portable designation, then put, you know, slash whatever. So if I was in Puerto Rico, I might put, I'd have KZT slash KP3. So if you do want to put VOTA, put it in between the CQ and between your call sign. And make sure you leave a space between both the CQ and the call sign. Can you edit the CQ message? Uh, yes, you can. And you can do it right on the fly down here. Now, just remember that if you change it down here, it'll stay that way until you unchange it. So if I put in CQJA and then I forget about it tomorrow, and I'm, tomorrow afternoon and I'm on 80 meters in the middle of the day, I can call CQJA all day and no JAs are going to hear me in Ohio, at, you know, in the middle of the day on 80 meters. So that's one of the things you might want to be aware of when you're putting this in there. It will continue to stay there unless you change it. Um, thanks. You can manually change it. Five watts. Five watts. I, I don't know the question there. ADAQ, five watts and 60. I'm not sure. Can you ask me that question out loud? Go ahead, Kyle. Go ahead and unmute. ADAQ? Yeah, go ahead. What's the question? I'm not hearing you. I'm not sure if you want to type if you want to type it in the in I the think chat. he's I think he's five watts and a sixty foot sloper is okay. Yeah, that's it's what I'm using right now. Okay. On one six yeah, the, so if I go over to one sixty, I'm gonna switch bands here. Let me just show you let me show a couple things here real quick and then I'll answer more questions. So if I want to change frequency, I come over here and I use the drop down. I'm gonna to go to one at one sixty, I'm gonna change my antenna. <sighs> Got that for set. So now you notice it changed right here to one dot eight four oh and now the whole band map will change. So again, I got to find an empty spot. I'll find an empty spot here. 
There's not a lot of activity on 160 right now, but we'll see what's there. Um, now, each time, each 15-second segment, it'll have a gray line here showing me what band I'm on. You can turn that on or off, so you may or may not be seeing your screen exactly the same way as me. I'm going to try calling this 88IF. It might take a little while because he's in a QSO, but he's nice and strong here, so we see if we get him. Okay, uh, P40 is Fox and Hound. He could have been Fox and Hound. I'm not sure whether he was Fox and Hound or not, but he was definitely MSHV. And I have a slide that demonstrates that. Let me bring that slide up here real quick. Give me one second to bring up another slideshow. As I said earlier, that's the short slide, so I have a really long one. And I also have a new one that I just put together for a DX group, so I'll bring that one up and show you that slideshow also. How do you handle a different location from home? The yeah, you can put a portable call sign in there, but one of the things is sometimes when it's a portable call sign, you'll see a bunch of dots in here because it can't show all the letters on here, even though it encodes it and sends it. So if you see a call sign with a bunch of dots here instead of a, with the brackets and dots, that means that the call sign is exceeding the limit for characters. Okay, so let me just show you real quick what he was talking about with Fox and Hound. This is um, a presentation that I put together for the um, DX group talking about new station working all time and while we're there let me just stop back one slide i thought this was in, this is what my setup in my house looks like i have a tower 50 foot tower and this is a 60 foot long uh sloper with a small loading coil right about here for 160 and it's also good on 40 meters and that's what i'm using on 160 right now i also have an 80 meter sloper and a 43 foot vertical which i use for 40 meters and 60 meters mainly Let's get to that section on. Okay, so down in the bottom left, this is showing Fox Hound mode. In Fox Hound mode, you'll see more than one set of call signs in the same line. In MSHV, you'll see multiple lines with a single call sign in it. Now, recently I'm seeing people that are having a combination of multiple lines in a multiple, multiple lines with multiple call signs in it. So they're obviously running Foxhound in an MSHV manner also. And these would be the DX stations that are calling. But when you see multiple stations in the same line, definitely Fox and Hound. When you see multiple lines with single stations in them, probably MSHV. If you see a combination of the two that run Foxhound. So when everyone is running Foxhound, you want to set your settings to run Foxhound. Let me show you how you do that. Before you used to have to go up to File, Settings, Advanced, and then choose the special mode you want, and then click the button here. In the new version 2.61, all you need to do is go over here and click on this little H. Everyone see where I'm clicking? If I click on that, that would put me in Fox Hound mode. I can also now switch between FT8 and FT4 and MSK and Q65 and J65 from here instead of going up to the top menu under mode and choosing what I want. Just be aware that if you end up with the wrong one here, you might be disappointed because you might not be seeing any stations. But right now I'm on FT8, which is what I want to be on. And I just worked that 88. AD8IF. I'm going to go back into CQ mode and see if someone else answers me. Let's see here. Just confirming 5 watts, but AM interested in the balance, etc. Yeah, it's it's. I'm running just 5 watts. That antenna is capable of a kilowatt, but I'm not running a kilowatt. Okay. Don't forget to change your grid square. Yes, if you go to a different location, it's very important that this be set up accurately. So let's go through a couple of the settings real quick here just to show you. The general settings tab is where you put your call sign and your six character grid square. Also make sure you have your region set properly there. These are all, all optional type of settings and you can play around with these and I discuss it more in the long slideshow. The radio tab is where you set up your COM port for your radio for CAT control and how you're gonna, how you're gonna key the radio. Audio is your sound card, 
And again, you want to make sure that your sound card is not set as a default on your computer. Uh, then there's information on reporting. If you go into reporting and check, check this little box that says enable PSK reporter, that means that you will be feeding spots out to PSK reporter whenever you decode. So when I go to bed tonight and I leave my radio on 160, it's going to continue to decode and it's going to continue to send spots up the PSK reporter. So if someone would see me there and try calling me, I'm not calling CQ, but they can still see me on the PSK reporter. They, they're not going to get any response because I'm going to be in bed. So two stations answered me, and because I have it set for maximum distance, it answered the WB1 instead of the 2SG. I'm going to say OK, and now what I'm going to do is I could wait, but instead, as soon as I'm done transmitting here, so I'm sending him the 73. I'm going to come up here and double click on the second station to work him. So my transmitter turned off now, and I'm going to double click on him, and what will happen is on the next sequence, I will send information to him if he's still listening he'll probably work me and we'll probably go on from there if not we'll see so i got my 73 from wb1 dmk i sent my minus six to n2sg we'll see whether he responds he's not in two land i think he's in florida yeah he's in florida because his grid square is el he may or may not respond to me if he doesn't i'll just come down here and switch back to cq Now, again, you can't do anything while you're waiting. Um, while I'm waiting for this, I'm going to mention that FT4 is not quite as sensitive, but the nice thing is it's twice as fast. It gets done in 7 seconds instead of 15 seconds. So if the band conditions are supporting it, I really strongly suggest you try out FT4. Uh, and I, people are finally getting the message, especially on the high bands where you might have fading taking place, like e-skip on, on 6 meters. I think FT4 is actually more effective because I get done quicker without the station fading away. And today on 10 meters, the FT8 portion of the band was crammed with stations. So people went up and started operating FT4 and I was making my contacts twice as fast. Okay, other questions? Please feel free to raise your hand. Dan, are you watching for hands there? We have any questions? Helps. Um, I, I am. I'm watching. The okay. Show. So I'm back to calling CQ. By the way, if anyone is operating FT8 and FT4 and you're on 160, give me a call. You can see me here. Typically what happens when I'm doing these presentations, someone calls me. Now, here's an interesting thing. I want to work the W1A3, but I can't work him because I'm transmitting on the same time he is. So I'm going to turn off my transmit and I'm going to wait and let a couple cycles go through and see if I can work him because I'm transmitting on the same time as all these stations on the left. I would never be able to work them. Well, we're not going to do that because two people just called me. So we'll answer them first and I'll go back and get the W. We do have two hands up. Okay. Very good. Uh, go ahead, Larry. Yeah. Uh, let's say you want to do uh, some messaging, you know, minimal rag chew. Can you use FT8 and FT4 for that? Or There's a better program to use. It's called J JS8 Call. It's built on the FT8 base, uh, uh, system software, but it lets you do keyboard to keyboard like PSK31. So it's JS8 Call. Okay, now, thank you. Now, the other thing you can do is if you're running this helper software, JT Alert, one of the things you can do is with JT Alert, it's putting the information down here, extra information. You might have a hard time seeing that, but it has their name and address. It's pulling that information in from QRZ in JT Alert. Also in JT Alert, there's a little tool here called View. And if I go to the messaging window, if the person has messaging turned on on their other end, I can send them a chat message via the internet. It isn't going to go out via FT8, but if I see someone that's having a problem operating and like they're on the wrong, uh, they're doing something wrong, I can see whether they're online and I can send them a chat via the internet through JT Alert. Now he's offline, he may not even be using JT Alert or he might have it turned off. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and halt this and I'm gonna see if well, we got another call there. Let's finish this other call sign up. Um, so I can do that through JT Alert. And again, JT Alert is an add-on. And if you're running Macintosh or Linux, it's called Alert JT. I'm sorry, Alarm JT is a very similar program. Uh, Brack, go ahead. Uh, 
Good Black. evening. Uh, thank, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my my current station or my current station setup. I've got a a home station, and I've just put together a mobile station of like a backpacking kit. Mm -hmm. you know? Yes. And uh, I'm still trying to figure out the best way to. Uh, again, I'm fairly new to ham radio anyway, but I'm trying to. Uh, I, I want to know how how do I set up if I'm doing an FT8 contact? How do I designate I'm mobile or I'm QRP or uh, you know do I do the slash and then QRP? Do I well, first first of all I operate 100% QRP and I never send the word QRP with my call sign. I wouldn't. Su I'd suggest you don't do that. Okay. Because some people won't answer you just because you said that, or they think they're not going to be able to make the QSO. So I'm actually doing a talk in two weeks for the on, on QRP for the RSGB, and that's one of the things I say in my talk. Don't sign QRP unless someone calls for QRP stations. Then I would answer, but I don't ever just say I'm QRP ahead of time. So oh, okay. I, I wouldn't worry about that. Um, but if you are portable, I would definitely make sure that you're using the right grid that you're at, and if you're portable outside your call area, I'd change the, I'd put portable, you know, whatever call area it's at. But if you're, let's say you get on the road and you're operating in the same grid from down the street, you know, the local park on the corner, which I do quite a bit, I don't change anything because I'm still in the same grid. Okay. So now, in, if I'm, in, if I'm activating a park, I would, I might put, I put POTA in there that I so let people know I'm operating POTA and I can actually have enough. There's enough characters to send a POTA exchange. I could put the POTA exchange in here and send the POTA exchange. So in WSJTX, I would change my my location designation. Yes. It would be really the only change that I would make. That's really the only thing you need to do. Now, the other thing you're going to want to do when you're operating portable is you're going to end up with two different logs unless you're using the same computer. If you're using the same computer, it's not a problem, but otherwise you want to combine your logs. Now, WSJTX keeps a log of its own, an ADIF yeah. log. And JT Alert keeps a log of its own. But what I have it set up is I have it set up so that whenever I make a contact in JT Alert, it on, I'm sorry, in uh, WSJTX, JT Alert sends that over to my regular log. So you notice in the background, the station I just worked is already in my regular log. I don't need to transfer it. And you guys might have noticed that when I work a station, um, what, when we finish up working the NASBE, uh, I'll get two screens. I'll get the one that says the log, which everyone gets, but then I'll get a second message from WSJTX that's, that's being sent to my log. And you can set that up with a variety of logs. I'm using Logic by PDA Software, but Log for OM, uh, Ham Radio Deluxe, a lot of the different programs you can set up so you automatically send the information over. Now, if you're operating in the field and using a different radio, I mean, a different computer, you're going to want to make sure you combine those logs. I would suggest you combine them in one central logging software that you can manage everything. And I have a whole presentation on logging software. Uh, it's tiny.cc slash a, I'm sorry, tiny.cc slash logging SW. Okay. So if I if I keep a log for my home station and then I upload that log to Logbook of the World and yep. then I keep I keep a log to my mobile station and then mm -hmm. I upload that log yeah. up to Logbook of the World it will put it together correct it, it will it, it'll put it together in Logbook of the World but you still need to keep a, a comprehensive log at your location yes. and remember yes. when you use when you're using Logbook of the World make sure you set up a different location for each of the places you operate Okay. And then my last question has yeah. to do with, with, uh, the JT alert software in mm -hmm. the, in the, in those boxes, I see CQ for most of them. Every, every once in a while, you'll see DX, you'll see POTA that, that, how do they, how is that set in JT alert? Uh, in WSJTX, these boxes you can put in, these are standard messages, but you can change this and have it you, for your 73 message. You can change that to something else. And then that will change it in JT alert. So if well, I'm listening JT to alert doesn't station, ever send anything. All it does is show you what's being sent. Oh, oh, so in order to get it onto for somebody else to see, yeah. that would be the last thing. But okay. All right. Yeah. That makes and, sense. and you can change these on the fly from here, or you can go into the setup 
I mean, the settings and then go into the one that says transmit macros and you can add any one you want. So you can see I had this one when I was trying to when I was trying to work Wyoming and I did this one wrong. I never used that. That was the wrong way to do it. It should have been CQ Wyoming KZTEN91. Uh, but I, this one here, I was telling people to try FT4 on 160, which is not common, but it was, I wanted some people to try it, so I was sending this out. But you can put, I, I gave my 1010 10 number, so I wanted a 1010 10 number, so I have that in there, so I can switch over to that and send the 1010 10 number. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, someone else had their hand up. I'm not sure who it was. Any other questions? Please feel free. Uh, let me check, get, get caught up on chat here. And JT Alert, the diamond in the top left corner means a person. Yes, there's a whole bunch of settings on JT Alert. Right now, when I hover over this, you'll see some information on this person. But this little diamond means that they they use a logbook of the world. The plus sign means something. And you can go down to these settings, and you can actually change what you're seeing. So the diamond means logbook of the world. The circle means EQSL. And the star means that they're online, so you can chat with them. When I showed you that little chat window before. You can also set up things like um, what you want to see. I have it turned on, so I'm seeing the state, I'm seeing the country, I'm seeing the DB, but I could turn any of these off that I didn't want. You can also set up uh, the ability to not see a station. So let's say this station, I don't want to see it anymore. I can right click on that station and I can remove it. I can put it on the ignore call sign list, or I can just say I want to put it on the call sign list to ignore it for right now. So let's say there's there's a DX station there. I'm not interested in working him. I've already worked him. I could put it so I don't see him in JT Alert. He'll still show up in my decodes over here, but he won't fill up this screen over on this side. Now, right now, I'm calling the W3 portable station, but it looks like someone's sort of gotten underneath me. So periodically, you have to check and make sure you're in a clear spot, which I wasn't anymore. So I moved back to a clear spot. And... Uh, I'm going to try and work that now. I'm not seeing him now, so maybe he's gotten up there, but okay. Um, on my FT991, nearing my bandwidth. No, it does not boost your signal. That's a fallacy. It doesn't really boost your signal. Now, let me tell you what does boost your signal. Staying in the center of the bandwidth will, will boost your signal, but don't narrow your bandwidth to try and increase your signal. It doesn't work. I see people putting that all the time. Staying in the middle of your bandwidth can be important for some radios, but narrowing your bandwidth is not the way to go because then you won't see people that are calling you. If you narrow your bandwidth and someone calls you at one end of the other and you're in the middle, you're not going to see that they're calling you or responding to you. By the way, on my K3S, when I have the filters wide open, I see a full 4,000 hertz. A lot of radios, you might only see 25 hertz. So if someone's calling down here at 500, don't call them at 3,000 because they might not have that bandwidth to be able to see all that way. I suggest you always stay within about 2,000 or, or less of a person you're trying to get a hold of. But don't narrow your bandwidth down. Okay, we got Pete with his hand up. Yeah, go ahead, Pete. Yeah, that was, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right, that was me who put that comment in there. Is yeah. He switched down to 500 hertz. I noticed that the DB reports increased by about 10 DB. But you're missing stations that are calling you on both sides. I only do that when I'm trying to work a, a weak station who can hear me, but I have a hard time hearing him. I will retune so he's at around 1500 plus or minus and narrow it down to 500 and it works. I hear him a lot stronger. And Are, are you uh, operating in single sideband or in data mode? data mode okay it shouldn't be doing that uh, i'm just saying it works and i don't know okay if it's just okay, I'll, my, I'll believe uh, you that it works it, it shouldn't be doing it though <laughs> it, it, it doesn't only, make only when i want to hear a weak signal okay. who's calling me but i'm well, not i'll, I'll experiment with that i'll i'll I'll, yeah. I'll try that out and i have a 991 here so i'll try that out and see if i notice a difference but i do know for sure that some radios when you get far away from the 1500 middle point they will not put out as much signal hmm. there are some radios that, that that's well known so you may want to stay sort of in the middle of the band and the other band you don't want to go on either end of is on 60 meters because you can end up outside the band 
right. very easily because the band is not that wide. So my other comment there was yes. uh, somebody had asked about how do you get something like Poda or Voda up in the uh, in the CQ and JT alert? Yes. Well, all you have to do is in that bottom bottom one there. Yeah, right put, here. Yeah, just put Poda, and now it's, I, I'm sorry. I thought he meant how were you getting the? Re I, I I didn't understand what he said. I thought he meant uh, now in his. He had to put it in JT alert. Yeah, whatever you put here will show up. Thank you. So let me just show you, uh, if I put in an, uh, something in here, you would see it. And I can't show it because I don't have another station. To... Is someone out there on 160 with me right now? I guess not. I was going to say we could actually demonstrate. It was funny. I was doing this talk for the ITU Region 2, and someone at the set talk I was doing was in, in uh, Peru, and he immediately came back to me, and we had a bunch of contacts on different we moved on different bands to see where it was open you'll be surprised if you've never worked this before you'll be surprised at the stations that you work uh on ft8 ft4 it is pretty remarkable sometimes i just worked a station minus 20 db in saudi arabia today second try it wasn't even a long time of trying to call them worked them very quickly so give it a try um, now, see, this station said in QRP, that's fine if he wants to do it, but I wouldn't do it because I just don't. It's, I see Victor's got his hand up. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Victor. Good evening, and thank you. Uh, with all the contacts you're making globally, uh, are you hearing from the Ukraine or are they still working on blackout on radio silence? <laughs> There are stations you hear from Ukraine. I don't know what the Ukraine is authorized stations, but there were stations on over the last nine months that were in Russian held territory. They weren't counted for different contests and things. I don't know what the current status of if the Ukraine has reinitiated licensed amateur operation, but for, until I hear otherwise, I don't work any Ukrainian stations. Good enough. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, the person was asking, I'm. Uh, WY7AA, I'm now on uh, 80 meters. Um, let me find a clear spot here. And I'll call CQ. See if you, you hear me. Okay. Uh, let's see. I got the right antenna. Good. But I don't have the antenna tuned properly. Let's tune the antenna up. There we go. Okay. Other questions? I don't see anything. Okay. Well, WY7AA is seeing if he can work me here. We'll see whether he does on 80. Yeah, I was going to try to do it. And I thought, no, that's not a good idea. I have too many things going here. <laughs> uh, I, I have this on the background, no matter what I'm doing. If I'm in the shack, FT8 is always, always on, or FT4 is always on in the background. Now, one of the things that will happen is you can, when in some of the settings, there he is, nice solid contact with Wyoming. He's uh, minus two dB here. So what I did is I responded back with minus two here. I'm glad I had this set for the maximum distance so that I would have answered the WB2AA that called me back at the same time. Oh, by the way, uh, some people think that where you're at on the band is where you're going to sort here. This is all randomized. At one time, it would have the lowest numbers at the top and the highest at the bottom. So people would try and get at the bottom of the band so they, they would show up earlier in the decode. But it doesn't do that. It does them randomly. So we had 1,400, 1,200, 1,100, 1,600, 600, 987. You don't end up in the decode in any order based on where you're at. Now, what does happen with the newer software, it actually starts decoding before the end of the 12 and a half seconds. So you'll see some stations pop up even before it gets to the decoding period. All those stations were decoded earlier, early in the cycle. Let me see if I can work the WB2 now. Thank you, RJ, for the contact with Wyoming. Any other questions I'd be happy to answer? There's a lot of different stuff in the in the full slideshow, um, you know, that I don't have time to cover in that one hour, but 
If you have any questions, please feel, to e feel free to email me. Did you put the link in the chat for that? Yeah, I'm going to do that right now. This is the this is the link for the full slideshow. And this is the link for all my presentations. While you're doing that, I'll answer Andy here. We're looking at additional I did that presentations for uh, in Rat Pack to cover on a number of different aspects of uh, of FT8, FT4, and their different uh, soft, uh, software corresponders, or what do you want to call it? Yeah, Dan and I were talking earlier today, and I think what we'd like to do is just do a whole session on just setting up your radio and your sound card and your computer. Because this, the same once you do this same setup for FT8, and FT, there's a Ukrainian station right there. Once you set this whole thing up for FT8 and FT4, you can also use the same setup by adding other software like VARA and then adding Wingland software or using uh, this same setup and then using FL Digi and doing RIDI or one of the other modes. So once you get your radio set up and functioning with the sound card mode, you can use a lot of different things. There's just a ton of other sound card modes out there besides FT8 and FT4. There's a lot of lots and lots and lots to learn here. Uh, and for one thing with FT8, FT4, you've got other programs, you've got the uh, uh, the grid tractor. You've got a jillion different other programs that need to be covered here, and you just can't do it in one session. Yeah, so this is, I'll bring up the grid tracker to show them what that looks like. So, mm -hmm. grid tracker is similar to what WJ, uh, the JT Alert does, but in this case, it gives you a visual map as opposed to just a. Um, let me move this out of the way a second here. By the way, you'll you'll soon find out that if you really get into these modes, you might want to consider adding a second and third monitor. Yes. <laughs> so I would normally not keep the grid tracker over top of everything. I'd normally have it off on another screen. See, this shows I'm transmitting right now. I'm not sure your colors are. It's it's kind of pale to see. This is a, a little yellow color, so you can see the grids I'm hearing right here. And I'm seeing this one station, which uh, in uh, this OM, although that's an HB, and then there's a French station I'm hearing on 80. I think I can zoom in on those. Yeah, there we go. That'll make it a little easier to see the stations I'm seeing. If I hover my mouse over, it tells me more details on it. He's got it turned off, but typically it will also show the paths they're listening to. Yeah. Okay, I'm having trouble working this one station. Now, occasionally you'll get to the point where you just never make the contact, and I'm not sure what the problem is, but... Oh, there we go. We made it. Just as I said that, we finished up. If you're only running a kilowatt... If he's running a kilowatt and you're only running five watts, yeah. it's, it's going to be an offset that's hard. Yeah, see, see this little window that popped up? That says it's sending it to my log. So when I go to my log, you'll see that he's the, right in there already in my log. But it's a fun thing to do while you're doing other things. The, the problem, one of the problems with FT8 and FT4 is it takes a little bit longer to make a contact um, than if, if the band is wide open. You know, try the other modes out too. When ten's wide open, you can make faster contacts with single sideband than you can with FT8, FT4. But when the band's marginal or you don't have a decent antenna, it can be a really great way to uh, make contacts on 80 meters with my five watts. I wouldn't be work. I wouldn't call CQ because I'm not going to get any responses. But I can call CQ on 80 or 160 with my five watts and get a power up like I did a little earlier. Other questions. A comment on the QRP. QRP forces you to prove your operating habits. And uh, once you get those things uh, worked on a little bit, it helps a lot also. It's amazing how quickly you catch on. I should be doing this instead of that. And I'm going to be doing this presentation for the RSGB tonight, 8 Live. And this is the 
link for that. Let me put the link in for this one. If you're interested in attending, this will be February, uh, not February. Yeah, February 6th, I'll be doing the presentation for the RSGB. It's uh, 20 U U UTC, so it'll be afternoon for most people or morning for some of you on the West Coast. But I also have the slide presentations already put together, so I can also add the slideshow so you can see what it looks like here. One second. We probably should be looking at wrapping this up pretty soon. Yep. Well, I figured because I started late, I should go extra long. There you go. <laughs> That's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. But you don't believe that because you know me. I could go extra long, even if I didn't start late. So here's the slideshow for the RSGB computer. Okay, I'll go ahead and stop my screen share. If you will email Anthony, he'd be glad to send you a list. He's got a lot of different presentations going on in a lot of different places, some of which you might be interested in watching. Yeah, and if you'd like one for your club, I'd be happy to do one for my list. I had to turn that screen share back on because look what's happening. I'm getting a friend station calling me on 80 meters with my little sloper here and my five watts. I didn't even call him. He called me. Okay, if we don't have any other questions, we'll have to stay in whether we see on that. Gary's gone, so I'm, I'm looking at the chat thing, and I don't see anything. <laughs> Somebody says it's his birthday. Well, happy jo join birthday. us, Ray, for your birthday, and we'll celebrate with RSGB uh, night. Oh, good, the friend station's answering me. He just I just worked the friend station on 80 meters, and I had someone else call me. Close that. Just a reminder, everyone, uh, upcoming Rat Pack sessions are available at ratpack.us. You can see all the information. Sign up for our mailing list uh, so that you can get uh, email notification of different things coming up. We'd love to be able to have you check in at different times. We meet every Wednesday and Thursday night with 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific, and right now it's 20200 UTC, but that changes when the time changes. Or maybe we won't ever do that again. I'm hoping the time doesn't change. You said that last year, too. I know. And if we do stick with one, I want to stick with the one we're in right now. I just wanted to make a do it one way or the other. <laughs> I'm part of the clock change. Okay, I'll close my screen share. That's me and two other LPI questions. calling you if you uh, if you see me. What's what's the call sign? November two, Lima, Victor, India. I see you. You got screen screen share turned off. Yeah, I'm trying to get. I, I'm trying to double click on him first before I lose him here. I'll put the screen share back on. So your your uh, minus fourteen minus seventeen minus seventeen minus eighteen yeah that's mm -hmm. no problem we can make contact. It's a hundred watts into an attic dipole. Yeah, see, in attic dipoles with a, is a great FT eight is great for attic dipoles. Also, lots of other convenient antennas like loops and stuff like that uh, not always have the greatest effect, but it works well with this stuff. Okay, folks. Here we go. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Well, you're very welcome. It's been great to have everyone here tonight. Go ahead and un un highlight me, Dan. You are. You have been. Okay. I did that so when people thought they came on board. Very good. Well, I guess we are done with questions, done with answers. And Anthony's having a lot of fun. After he closes out, after I close things out, you know what he's going to be doing. Oh, I think I'm going to eat dinner, maybe. <laughs> <laughs>
I haven't, I've been on the run since 5.30 tonight. I had another meeting before this, the two meetings before this tonight. Okay, I don't know when he gets the chance to sleep because he's got so much on his plate. Well, if we don't have any more questions, we have any comments, you may want to open it up for comments. By the way, if you haven't gotten on 10 meters in the last couple of days, the sunspot numbers of 220s, get on. The big thing I'd like to say thank on. you. <laughs> I'd like to say thank you for the presentation. It was great. Oh, you're very welcome. All right. I'm going to say 73s, everyone, and I'll catch you next go around. 73. <laughs>